there is not going to be a tornado. It's just a thunderstorm. Everything's going to be okay. Why weren't you answering my calls? Look, I'm sorry. I just... I think it's an EF5. What the hell's an EF5? It's like when two tornadoes come together and they form one giant tornado. Mom, I think something might be wrong. <laughs> Won't open. A tree is blocking the door. Can't we just break the door down? That thing is made of solid oak. I can't just punch through it. Doesn't make any sense. What doesn't make any sense? We have neighbors. Someone would have come. They're all dead. Why would you say that? What if it wasn't just a storm? Let me out of here! I need help! What did you see out there? Not a tornado. Something else. I was scared. Scared of what? Of you. We did something bad. There's not gonna be a tornado. It's just a thunderstorm. Everything's gonna be okay. Why weren't you answering my calls? Look, I'm sorry, I just... I think it's an EF5. What the hell's an EF5? It's like when two tornadoes come together and they form one giant tornado. Mom, I think something might be wrong. <laughs> Won't open. A tree is blocking the door. Can't we just break the door down? That thing is made of solid oak. I can't just punch through it. Doesn't make any sense. What doesn't make any sense? We have neighbors. Someone would have come. They're all dead. Why would you say that? What if it wasn't just a storm? Let me out of here! I need help! What did you see out there? Not a tornado. Something else. I was scared. Scared of what? Of you. We did something bad.
weather's not gonna be our tornado. It's just a thunderstorm. Everything's gonna be okay. Why weren't you answering my calls? Look, I'm sorry, I just... I think it's an EF5. What the hell's an EF5? It's like when two tornadoes come together and they form one giant tornado. Mom, I think something might be wrong. <laughs> Won't open! A tree is blocking the door! Can't we just break the door down? That thing is made of solid oak. I can't just punch through it. Doesn't make any sense. What doesn't make any sense? We have neighbors. Someone would have come. They're all dead. Why would you say that? What if it wasn't just a storm? Not a tornado. Something else. I was scared. Scared of what? Of you. We did something bad. There's not gonna be our tornado. It's just a thunderstorm. Everything's gonna be okay. Why weren't you answering my calls? Look, I'm sorry, I just... I think it's an EF5. What the hell's an EF5? It's like when two tornadoes come together and they form one giant tornado. Mom, I think something might be wrong. <laughs> Won't open! A tree is blocking the door! Can't we just break the door down? That thing is made of solid oak. I can't just punch through it. Doesn't make any sense. What doesn't make any sense? We have neighbors. Someone would have come. They're all dead. Why would you say that? What if it wasn't just a storm? Not a tornado. Something else. I was scared. Scared of what? Of you. We did something bad.
there's not gonna be a tornado. It's just a thunderstorm. Everything's gonna be okay. Why weren't you answering my calls? Look, I'm sorry, I just... I think it's an EF5. What the hell's an EF5? It's like when two tornadoes come together and they form one giant tornado. Mom, I think something might be wrong. <laughs> Won't open! A tree is blocking the door! Can't we just break the door down? That thing is made of solid oak. I can't just punch through it. Doesn't make any sense. What doesn't make any sense? We have neighbors. Someone would have come. They're all dead. Why would you say that? What if it wasn't just a storm? Let me out of here! I need help! What did you see out there? Not a tornado. Something else. <laughs> I was scared. Scared of what? Of you. We did something bad. Welcome to another edition of Dissecting Horror, the virtual panel series where we talk to the up and comers, the movers and shakers doing horror these days during these crazy times. We get to talk to a lot of the actors and filmmakers and cast and crew behind a lot of today's best, most exciting indie and mainstream releases today is no exception. Today, it's all about we need to do something. Now, I'm sure you've already heard about this film because it's been generating some tremendous buzz ever since it premiered to insane reviews out of Tribeca. So you've already heard about this film. You knew it was coming. It was just released by IFC Midnight. So you can check it out now on VOD, probably select theaters. Look it up. We need to do something. It's out now. By the way, IFC Midnight, I received your care package of the uh, uh, popcorn. We need to do something popcorn tin and my little uh, we need to do something uh, snake pin. Thank you very much. Those who have seen the film know what the little snake is all about. We'll be talking about that. Now, we've been doing this dissecting horror panel series for a while. And you guys know that the best episodes are the ones that I'm genuinely the most excited to talk about the film. And that's what's happening tonight. I'm really excited to talk about this film because uh, quite frankly, I haven't been able to think about much else since I first saw this film a couple of days ago. This is a film that's gonna stick with you. It's gonna make you think. Uh, it's got some real fun twists. It is a roller coaster, and I really mean that in every sense of the word. So I'm super excited to talk about We Need to Do Something, and I'm super excited to be here with the people who made We Need to Do Something, literally, uh, celebrate their accomplishment. Let me introduce you to everyone we're here with. We've got the film's director, the mysterious Sean King O'Grady. How are you, sir? Uh, I'm well. How are you? I'm doing really good. Uh, really excited to have you on the panel, mostly because your your bio when we announced this show was so slim. I think one little sentence. So uh, you are to me uh, uh, an enigma. 
um, you know, a, a bowl of mystery that I'm anxious to uh, spoon into a little bit here during this next hour. Loved your film. Uh, really stoked to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, we have the screenwriter and producer, Max Booth III. How are you, Max? I am splendid. Thank you for having me. On well, thank show. you. Thank you for being here. Now, uh, you probably know this, but you're not just the screenwriter. You also wrote the novella uh, that the film is based on. Did you know? You, you were aware. You were aware of that. Um, no, so, you know, again, no one told me this. I'm glad to I'm glad to make you aware in that case. Uh, my, my point being that, you know, it gives me faith that this is a, a true adaptation of the source material uh, in many ways. You know, I'm excited to talk about all kinds of things with you, uh, go down the uh, little avenues that that this film, uh, uh, the story, uh, this wonderful thing that is we need to do something uh, uh, goes down. It is quite quite a ride, quite a tremendous thing. You, you and Sean uh, did some great work and you were ably aided by uh, one of the film stars who's here with us, Pat Healy. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Well, uh, so thrilled to have you here. You know, uh, I've been in horror for a minute. And so, you know, uh, I've been a fan, you know, you were in The Innkeepers, you were in Cheap Thrills, which is still just such a fun movie that I feel like I watch four or five times a year just to a year, like, wow. Some years, some years up to that much. <laughs> I mean, it's just such a good film. It, it never fails to just really uh, put, put a smile on my face. Not only that, uh, you're currently working on a, a really big film. Uh, I think I wrote down the name. Oh, yes, Killers of the Flower Moon. Are, are you still on set there? Yes, I am. I'll be here another, what is it? Uh, about another week. Been wow, here for fantastic. almost five, five months, yeah. Yeah, and I think you mentioned during Tech Check that you'll be wrapping right around your 50th birthday. So, uh, right, early, on my, yeah, 50th birthday, yeah, yeah. Early happy day. birthday, early happy birthday. Thank you. you know, I know that you're going to be talking about uh, Mr. Scorsese and this current project for a long time, but this hour is all about we need to do something. And there's so much to talk about with that film, and I'm so excited to talk about that film. But it, it was exciting to note that you're currently working on this uh, wonderful film that also has a lot of excitement. So we're certainly uh, uh, honored that you're able to take a break from that project to uh, touch base, stop in and, and celebrate uh, you know, what you guys did with uh, We Need to Do Something because you guys really did something incredible. Uh, thank you for being thank here. You. Last but certainly not least, Emmy winner, Amy Williams, the production designer. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Amy. Thanks for inviting me. For sure, for sure. Uh, you know, I'm sure uh, in case you didn't know, you are an Emmy winner, like I mentioned. Uh, extensive history in film and TV. Uh, worked on Master of None, uh, including earning a producer credit on season three. Uh, currently, your, your uh, work is highlighted on Crashing, which is a Judd Apatow series on HBO. So you're just doing incredible things. And I'm so stoked that you're here because, uh, you know, this is a, a single setting film for the most part, primarily. Uh, so that single setting just has to carry so much uh, importance. Uh, and, and I was knowing that, you know, you were gonna be on this panel, I was really scrutinizing this unique setting, uh, not or, or ununique actually, uh, ununique setting for this very uh, unique scenario, uh, just how it really uh, added to the story. And I'm really excited to to talk to you about this deceptively simple set, you know, uh, patterns on the floor and color choices and, and all kinds of cool stuff. And I'm just really thrilled that you were able to be here. Great, thanks. Thank you, thank you. So let's just have at it. Uh, kind of want to start with you, Sean, just because like I said, I, I know so little about you. I have a feeling people are going to be talking about you a lot uh, in the future because you directed this amazing film called We Need to Do Something. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you arrived at this project? Yeah, so I've produced um, you know, a handful of narrative features and had the opportunity to work with a lot of really great filmmakers. And over the, the whole course of that period of time, I've been waiting to make my first narrative feature. I've worked in documentaries as well as a director and a producer. But, but just really needed the right thing to come around. Um, so when the world shut down in early 2020 and all of us kind of stopped doing everything, I, like an idiot, decided that was the moment that I had to make a film. And so I, I knew 
so I had a, a garage that I converted into a sound stage. And then I had a camera and I had some lights and I had some things. So I wanted to see what I could do with the resources that I had to just get back to making films. And like one day into, into deciding that I was officially going to do a film, I'd started writing something, I had blinders on. I got an email from my partner, Bill, who was like, dude, I've read the script for the thing that we have to make. And I was like, whatever, I'm really not interested in reading it. I mean, I'm dead set on this other idea that I just started on. And he was like, no, you have to read it now. And he never does that to me ever with anything. So the next morning I woke up really early before the sun was up and started reading Max's script. We need to do something. And um, about 25 pages in, I jumped while reading. And that's never happened to me before. That has never happened to me since. I actually jumped. And obviously those of you who have seen the movie will know it was the, the good boy moment. But at that, at that moment, I was thinking, okay, this might change my path of what the next couple months of my life were going to be like. And it did. And, and a little over a year later, you know, we're still here and we're actually talking about the movie. We sure are. And, and truthfully, we're just getting started. And the conversations surrounding this film are going to continue long after this hour is done because there's a so much to talk about in this film. Uh, it was, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, you know, uh, if this is a product of the pandemic, then that's just another uh, example of something wonderful that came out of su such a terrible situation and, and art really prevails. And I'm so glad that you did take this opportunity to do something really worthy because uh, um, uh, we need to do something. It's just an incredible film. And, you know, uh, uh, clearly, uh, 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 Max's work uh, spoke for itself and you know you really lucked out uh, connecting uh, with such a brilliant storyteller uh, Max huge fan huge fan uh, just based on uh, this film we need to do something and like I said uh, knowing that you're the screenwriter and you also wrote the source material just uh, makes me just so impressed with uh, what you've done and what you've been able to communicate so uh, really thrilled to have you here um, can you just kind of uh, something I've already kind of hit on how how similar is the novella to the screenplay? It's pretty similar. I mean, there's a few things different, like with um, the character Pat plays is pretty it's not completely different, but those differences because in the book, the book takes place in Texas and the dad is really much a Texan. And we kind of changed that a bit with the scripts because it just it just didn't seem right. Because Pat and, um, just ain't no Texan. He could probably do it. I could have done it. <laughs> We're shooting in Michigan. What do you want? Yeah. <laughs> There's a few other differences. Um, some of the scenes are restructured but they will still end the movie as they are in the book. Um, there's, a, there's a huge difference until the end, but I don't know if we want to jump right in into talking about that. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about the end a, a yeah. little bit later. Uh, for all of you here who haven't seen the film yet, we, we kind of decided amongst ourselves that we'll get progressively more spoily, spoilery throughout the hour. So consider yourself warned. You know, we'll, we'll try to tell you when to, you know, put your fingers in ears and go la la la, Pat, that, that we, is what we decided was the, <laughs> yes, follow, follow Pat's example when we uh, uh, warn you of spoilers. Uh, no, but, but that's fantastic. Uh, you know, I was reading too uh, in the interview you did with our writer, Michelle, about how the, the, the book also takes place primarily just in the single setting. So it wasn't like that was a, a decision you made for the film. That was an aspect of the story that was integral to its very roots. Yeah, I'm just a big fan of one setting uh, books and movies. I enjoy writing in limited settings just because my favorite thing to write is dialogue. So with a limited setting, you have to kind of rely on dialogue and it's, it's fun to inflict like a sense of claustrophobia when writing and with one settings, you really have that. And also when you have like one setting, like for example, with this bathroom book and movie, you have a set, you have a set of rules that you come up with immediately, you know, okay, these kills can't leave the bathroom. So you know what they can't do, which makes it easier to come up with what they can do. So it's, it's kind of a fun challenge that way. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, just uh, such a fantastic story uh, that really lended itself perfectly to uh, uh, Sean's directing, uh, Pat's acting, Amy's uh, brilliant production design it clearly just came together uh, in a really wonderful way. And, you know, I just can't wait for more people to see it and more people to get as excited about it as I am. Uh, Pat, uh, uh, pivoting over to you, uh, you know, I, I did have my fanboy moment in, in the tech check and the sound check, I won't lie, you know, I'm a huge fan. Uh, you're, you've just done so many great things and, you know, in indie horror and even mainstream horror, everyone knows you and, and, and loves what you do. So I'm just thrilled to, to have you here and to meet you. And, you know, uh, I'm just curious what attracted you besides the obvious, I mean, maybe it is just so obvious, what attracted you to the film? What made you want to play Robert? Yeah, I mean, I think it is pretty obvious. It's a really great script and a, and a great role. I worked with uh, Sean and Bill on another film called Dinner in America, just did a little bit in it, but we didn't really get to know each other there. But uh, we had seen each other at Sundance and then uh, about, uh, I think it was like late July, early August of last year, I had been in a car accident just before COVID hit. So I was kind of laid out for a oh, while. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, it's fine. I'm good now. And, but I was, you know, just starting to heal uh, right around that time, you know, feel better and uh, being able to get out, be, do physical activity and stuff again. And uh, I just had assumed that I wouldn't be working for the rest of the year. I just assumed nothing would be happening. And then I got, I heard from Bill and he wanted to send the, the script and that Sean was directing it. And I read it. I just was looking at, cause Sean, you brought this up to me the other day, but I, I had read the, um, read the script and then I had to read it a second time. Cause it's just, it was like, I was like, I wasn't sure I like caught everything or that I got it right. And I wrote something back to them, like that I told them that they were totally out of their minds and they were totally insane. But I, that made me want to do it. I mean, it was a really um, interesting role. It had some things that I'm, I, I'm, you know, pretty good at, and some things I hadn't done before. So that's always good for me. Something I know I can do, but also other things that are going to be a challenge. And uh, the other, the rest of the cast obviously is great. And uh, yeah, I just loved the whole idea of it. And I, you know, knew you get a pretty good sense talking to a director before you ever get on set, what kind of director they're going to be and if they're going to be the kind of director that you like and a director that likes actors and, you know, is good with working with them. And Sean certainly was that, so. Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, uh, that's great that you mentioned the, the rest of the cast because, yeah, I, I wish we could have them all here. The, the, the cast is phenomenal. You had uh, Sierra McCormick uh, as Melissa, uh, the main character, uh, whatever this uh, disaster situation seems somehow uh, psychically connected to her. Uh, Vanessa Shaw played your wife, Diane. Uh, the chemistry between you two was just uh, terrifyingly tense at times, uh, so confrontational, you know, it was hard to breathe when the two of you were up in each other's faces. Just some wonderful acting between the two of you. Uh, Lizette Alexis played Amy, who we only kind of see in flashbacks, but uh, another really fun character who had it a lot. And in there in the bathroom with you, uh, John James Cornyn, uh, Bobby, uh, what a tremendous young actor, uh, really just uh, took the, the movie to some of its uh, highest and lowest points. Uh, just uh, with some real aplomb for a, a, such a young actress. Yeah, the, the entire cast was amazing. Uh, truly a, a wonderful uh, collaboration, uh, which also included, although she wasn't there at the time, Amy Williams, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, you you made uh, you, you were the production designer, but I guess you weren't there during the actual filming and everything. So uh, I love having uh, people on the panel who, who came from the film at a different angle. And I'm really excited to talk to you about we need to do something. Such a great film. My first question for you is, as somebody who clearly uh, knows the, the art of production design, when you get a script and you find out that the entire thing is just one location, it, does that uh, make you more excited or less excited about the project? This situation, I was you know, very excited. I, I think limitations create the best kind of art. Uh, and you know the the timing worked out. I don't think 
you know, if this had been a production with multiple sets and locations, I, I wouldn't have been able to be involved. Um, I was in New York when we started it. I, I had to jump onto another show in London while the filming was going on. Um, so to be able to, you know, be involved in this and uh, create a set with Sean using Max's words um, and, you know, giving us space to the actors was, you know, really, really exciting. Yeah. So uh, as someone who, who did, hasn't read the novella myself, let me ask you, uh, how many of the, the visual cues did you take from the novella? Uh, was it very descriptive in terms of color and textures, tile and stone and things like that? You know, not too much. I think uh, there were a lot of liberties that we could take with it. Um, you know, the way it read in the novella was, I think, you know, much smaller space without windows. Uh, and, you know, we, knowing that we, so everything was set in this, the same space and the audience had to be within the space, um, you know, we kept fighting against boredom, I think, you know, trying to provide, you know, the right color palette for the story and, you know, the space and the layout and, and you know, some hidden Easter eggs here, there. Um, so we really got to play around a lot. I think Sean and I batted, you know, a few different ideas around for the set before we landed on um, this crazy pink and burgundy nightmare. <laughs> Yeah, a, a beautiful pink and burgundy nightmare. I actually tried to arrange my my lights uh, today to kind of recreate the color palette that you created. Uh, I did see your little cat jump up there. I love I love little critters. That's why if you saw my face brighten up all of a sudden, it's just like I'm that guy, that horror guy who loves cat videos and things like that. No, but uh, it's so great to hear it. And you kind of like opened it up with Easter eggs because now I just have to get a little deeper. We are going to start talking about some spoilery-ish things, you know, because you, you've got this film that, uh, you know, for the first act, act one at least, uh, there's really nothing that's happening really that, that can convince you that there's anything beyond a normal, explainable disaster happening. Uh, there, there's not too much, I mean, there's urgency to the situation. This family is trapped but it's probably just your run of the mill tornado. You know, we have a lot of tornadoes. There's really not a lot else going on to uh, make us afraid of much beyond what our minds can already wrap itself around. Uh, at a certain point, uh, we start to suspect that it, it might have something to do with witchcraft, that there might be elements of witchcraft uh, to, to explain what's going on. And, and my question to you is, you know, or, or my observation or what, what I want to talk about with you. Once I started thinking about the possibility of witchcraft, I started to notice patterns in the tile. And I wondered if it, the tile floor was sort of uh, an altar in some ways. The, the bathtub area was definitely an altar. Um, and we did, you know, we did work in, uh, you know, a lot of Wicca and witch, witchcraft symbols. There was, you know, the whole set, if, if you trace it from corner to corner, makes a pentagon mm. um, over the bathtub. We had like a double pentagon to kind of represent the relationship between Melissa and Amy. Um, and yeah, Sean and I had a lot of fun trading. Uh, yeah, I didn't even get that deep into it, but I knew there, I had a feeling there was something that definitely uh, percolates all the way into the subconscious so uh, fantastic job you know at, at communicating this subliminally uh, to, to tremendous uh, creepy effect sean you wanted to add something no no i just want to say you are the um you're the first person to bring up the altar concept who wasn't involved in the making of the film it's interesting nice. talk to some other people about it and they've they've like so you've seen that moment of realization but you went there it's very cool well, I mean, I went there because the, it was communicated through visual cues, uh, which is just a testament to this great team that you've got going. Thanks for making me feel smart. You know, I do, I do have a literary degree, so you know, I, I'm trained to notice things like symbolism and subtext. No, that that really uh, makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I was on the right track. It's going to make the last 15 minutes of this panel really fun because I'm just going to go all out there and ask if what I think is happening is really happening. We're really, we're gonna crack this nut and get messy with it, but not yet, not yet. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for um, uh, yeah, just for, for confirming that. Uh, it's really an exciting moment uh, in, in conversational uh, 
uh, exploration of cinema. Um, this is this is kind of for everyone. This is for the group. I kind of want to talk about jump scares uh, in general, and then specifically with this film. The, okay, uh, our reviewer, our writer Michelle, told us all. Uh, everyone at Dread Central has been really looking forward to this film. She said there was an epic jump scare. So I'm watching it and I'm prepared. I'm like, okay, there's going to be an epic jump scare, and something. Ju- sometimes just knowing that is enough to brace yourself or give you enough of a heads up to where it doesn't really affect you or it'll affect you, but you'll still be like, okay, I was waiting for something. The jump scare, that scene in We Need to Do Something is wonderful. And even knowing that a jump scare existed, it was so special and just such a a physical experience for me. For me, it felt like being in an airplane that just lost altitude, that just kind of like dropped out of the sky. It's that good a jump scare. And part of what makes that jump scare so tremendous is that it kind of breaks the rules of jump scares, doesn't it? I mean, it it doesn't scare you for being loud or gory or violent. It scares you just for completely uh, skewing your worldview in a heartbeat. Like I said, you know, the the first act of the film, there's there's plenty to hold on to rationally in terms of what, what is in store for this family trapped. And uh, the, everything turns on this jump scare that all of a sudden calls everything into question. Uh, and just hearing, uh, uh, Sean, just hearing you say that you jumped just reading it is such a testament to this uh, moment that that doesn't even need a, an actual a visual aid or an auditory aid to convey just this uh, uh, loss of uh, solid ground. Uh, anyone, please t- tell me tell me about this amazing jump scare. Jump scares in general, and this specifically specifically this amazing jump scare. Well, I think I could... the jump, like the concept of a jump skill is you will doing something unexpected. So specifically with the good boy scene, we spend like a good half hour establishing what this universe is. And then we immediately pull the sheet out and reveal something else. So I think it, a lot of it just has to do with the rhythm and the, the mood you establish. And it, yeah, I mean, a jump skill doesn't have to be a loud noise. It just has to be a, a sudden change in the way you see things. I can say that they jump scared us on the set, at least in the first take by actually playing that really loud without, because usually Sean or someone would read off camera lines, but that we were doing it and they just, crank the volume up and played that that when we weren't expecting it and it did scare all of us and then we found out who it was and that was like super awesome too uh, yeah, we, so we, was, received, yeah. we had received that Aussie recording a few days before we shot the scene and so we had our sound designer and editor put together um like a fully effects edited scene it was like it was, all, it was not exactly the where we landed um but it, it was pretty close uh, to what you hear in the final film and played that blisteringly loud for the cast on set. Max actually was the one who hit the play button outside of the door. Nice, nice. So yeah, the film's been out for almost a week now. Cat's out of the bag. There is a cameo by Ozzy Osbourne, uh, off-screen cameo, uh, right at this pivotal moment where the entire movie just goes from being intense as fuck to completely fucking otherworldly and ape shit. How did you get him? Uh, how did you make that happen? Uh, well, I think if you're going to, you know, pull the rug out from under uh, all reality and, and open up the gates of hell, who better to do it than the Prince of Darkness himself? Uh, <laughs> and I can't one our, argue. One of our executive producers, Donovan Leach, is like family friends with Ozzy, which is still the weirdest thing ever to me. It seems like, you know, like a, like a genuine rock demigod you cannot be family friends with. Lo and behold, he is. And I, I wish there were some like, crazy story of how hard it was to get him. It was like Donovan called and he said, yes, he had a very strange request, which involved something that we had to give him in a paper bag, but that's a story for another day. We did mm. that. And a couple of days later, we, uh, we had our recording. And by the way, that what we have in the film, I think is great. And if you watch all the way to the end credits, there's another little piece of Ozzy that you can hear. Um, but what's on the cutting room floor, I'm hoping that we can make it onto some bonus features one day because Ozzy gave us absolute gold. Like, it, it's just phenomenal. I think that this character, Max didn't write it with him in mind, but 
when you hear him do it, it couldn't have been anyone else. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yeah, this is a big spoiler. At the same time, it's on the IMDb page, people. You want to know a little bit about the, the movie you haven't seen yet? You can go find out. You would have found out before that Ozzy Osbourne were there. But it was a delightful surprise. It was a really delightful surprise. Uh, just such a, a wonderful moment. Um, but it's not... The, the film doesn't just rely on that one moment in any capacity because you made an incredibly scary film leading up to that. And it goes to some really far out places uh, after this, this pivotal moment. So it's all just so exciting. So exciting. Um, let's see. The, the uh, other thing I did want to mention, you got uh, Ozzy isn't the only musician you got to do an off screen cameo, right? Uh, Dan, John Miller. Yeah. So uh, how was that? Was that just another friend of the producer? No. Yeah. Dan John's a friend of a friend of mine and a friend of Bill's, the other one of the other producers. And um, we you know for the longest time, it was actually the part of the movie that I hated the most. I loved what was happening, but it was my voice that that was just like tempted in there as the, the voice outside the door. And it just it drove me insane. And and so we were fortunate enough that Dan John came in and, and helped us do that. I think he just absolutely killed it. It makes that it took that scene from being one of my least favorites to one of my favorites. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, Amy, a uh, question for you. Uh, the beetle on Bobby's shirt. Uh, was there a, a de- what was the thought behind that? Because it was a detail that really stuck with me the entire time. Uh, this was something that, you know, Sean had found, um, and we designed a few different options. I was in London at the time and, uh, we designed a few different options. And I think it, I think a similar beetle was on a, like a Japanese shirt that the costume designer had found. And, um, yeah, and it just sort of, uh, fit. We found the right sort of, uh, illustration. We liked the beetle because Bobby ends up as bug food. Oh, uh, so it's a little bit of uh, <laughs> it's a little bit of uh, dark foreshadowing. Yes, and if someone really cares enough, they can look up what it says in Korean underneath the um, underneath the image. Okay, okay, yeah, we'll definitely have to put that challenge out there to our community. Let's, uh, I don't know, maybe we can give them one of those cool T-shirts you're wearing to the first person who can. Uh, 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 email info at dreadcentral.com with the answer. Uh, can you show us your that. shirt, by the way? It, it was something that, uh, oh, we heard it here. Yeah. We can do it. Prototype. Yeah. Nice. We do. Yeah, we're good. Cool but what I love about that shirt is it really encapsulates the entire film in, in this single square, which is kind of like the entire film does take place in this single square. That, so it's, uh, it's, it's really telling. It's really telling. Yeah, the artist did a tremendous job. I, I am not, I don't appear to be featured that prominently on it, but we can talk about that later. Sure, I don't want to make a big deal about it. I'm All also right. not on it, and I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. Your name is. Oh. You should have called all, it. You all of your names are. You should have called us, Sean. You really should have. You should have called us first. Well, listen, uh, play with that. We're about to open yeah. it up for some uh, questions from the audience, but I did just have like a few uh, other questions. Uh, Pat, uh, I'm curious what the mouthwash you guzzled, what that actually was. It's just water. It's just colored it's water. water. But it, it, it was a mouthwash bottle, so it had a, you know, it had a, a hint of mouthwash, you know, much like the LaCroix has a, h- a hint of whatever this is, pineapple and apple it was like a hint of listerine you know i gotta admit i was um, secretly hoping that it was just real mouthwash and you just went there that you just like oh, I, did it. I, I yeah i could i could try and pull that off and tell you that and you'd think i was even more of a badass than you already think i am but no <laughs> i was just just water that's hard to drink a lot of that and we did it a few times so i drank a lot of liquid that day i couldn't yeah. believe it i couldn't believe you kept chugging it it I don't, I don't know well, where it was going. It's the kind of thing where it's like the kind of work, the approach that I take to my work, which is like, well, it's in the script, so I have to do it, you know? Unless I disagree with it in some way, then it's going to do it until we got it. You know? I mean, blood, sweat, and tears, that's what it takes. Well, all right, let's let's open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, we got uh, Miguel Myers, 78, over on Twitch. Uh, he says, I heard the movie was a lot longer than what was actually released. 
uh, are, were there any scenes that y'all were sorry to see go? Yes. <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> yes. Uh, there were a few really great monologues that, that we had that had to just be cut in service of the overall narrative where the, the emotional beats that we needed to hit were there and were already working. Um, and it was painful decisions to make when you're cutting great moments of performance. Um, but unfortunately it, it had to be done. And uh, that's you know, never fun, I think, for anybody involved in something. There was nothing, there was nothing in this movie that we cut that I didn't love. That was the really, the re actually the really painful thing about it. It's not like sure. it was just you know, not working. Yeah, that's got to hurt. I, well, I mean, are you still putting together a DVD release, Blu-ray? Are, are we going to perchance see some of these deleted scenes? Absolutely. Awesome. That's exciting. Uh, Amy, got a question for you. Uh, uh, I guess they uh, thought it was really cool about the stuff about the altar. Was there anything else you did on set that people might not have caught when watching the film the first time? Any other Easter eggs you want to reveal? There's a few. Uh, Max pointed out one. Uh, today, which was, uh, we actually kept a bottle of witch hazel in the bathroom, uh, which was a last minute purchase by our, our director, Angie. Um, if you look at the windows, there's definitely some symbolism there uh, in the numbers of glass blocks and, and the way they're arranged. Oh, wow. The, uh, the other, the set is also, um, there's a ton of pentagrams worked in. There's a lot of little triangles that sort of, you know, represent, uh, you know, both the nature of Amy and Melissa's relationship and, and also the different earth symbols. Um, the set is actually kind of shaped in a cross shape. So you, you have sort of a quadrant for each of the family members to go oh, wow. to and to hide to. Um, and that kind of spoke to the different elements in, in, in witchery. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's I mean, snakes I, in there somewhere too. Isn't there snakes in the tile somewhere? Yeah, the, I, I mean, you could that? say that the zigzags have that. Um, and I think, I think we, we wrote in some subliminal messages into the foam rocks that are along the wall. <laughs> nice. There's, there's, what, there's, there's not an angle, there's not a single shot in the movie where you're seeing a bit of the set where there's not some sort of symbolic Easter egg. I love it. I can't wait to go back and watch this again and again. Uh, it, and it also really kind of bolsters my theory about you know what's actually going on, which uh, you know will, will be fun to, to dive into in a little bit once we get through a few more of these uh, questions from our viewers. Pat, here's one for you. Uh, what helps you get into character right before the camera rolls? I, uh, I've always had the ability to, uh, not in other aspects of my life, but certainly in the acting work, to really just snap into focus when I need to. So uh, you know, I'm sure that these guys will tell you I'm cracking jokes uh, as, we're, as we're, you know, getting ready to roll. And then as soon as we're there, I, I've always been able to snap in and out of it, which has been a great tool for me in life because sometimes you show up to work and it's not a great day or you know you're going through a tough time or whatever I've always been able to just go into that world uh and you know it certainly helps to have great a great set you know a, gr or a great location or set and to um you know have other great actors there and have the mood you know be set by all of that um, this was interesting too, because it was like sort of the first thing maybe that I've ever worked on where the entire crew was, ha because of COVID had to be away and the, right. those people that you could see had masks on and so it wasn't a lot of distraction in that way. It was really sort of easy to get into it that way. I mean, I like to do like most of the work I do is, is beforehand. It's just preparing uh, for, you know, preparing with the script, you know, which I had for several months before we started shooting so that when I go, I can just, I'm able to just, you know, snap right into focus whenever I need to. And uh, apparently I have an, a, a bottomless pit of rage within me, according to my filmography. Okay. That just can be tapped at any time. 
Nice, nice. Remind me not to piss you off. Oh, for better or worse. <laughs> Man, if you ever write a book about your life, Pat, A Bottomless Pit of Rage is the title. So there you go. The title. Yeah. And, it, and it really writes itself from there on out. Uh, Max, uh, thank you for, uh, however briefly, showing us your new little dude. Uh, you, you just got your puppy recently? Yeah, um, two weeks ago, I think now. His name oh, is Frank. Wow. Oh, Frank, I, they really do just like make our lives wonderful, don't they? He's, uh, his, he's named after Frank Booth from Blue Velvet. <laughs> nice, nice. Of course he uh, is. Hopefully, hopefully he's not quite as much of a handful as that uh, nefarious character. Um, I do have a, a question here for you, too. Uh, let's see. Max, do you personally have a favorite scene in the film and why? Yeah, there's a great scene in the movie where Pat gives a like a seven like a seven minute monologue about a snake he has he used to have as a kid. I think it's like Pat's best acting of all time, possibly, and it really like concretes the type of character he is in the movie. And it's just it's a perfect scene, and I'm so glad we we kept it. Okay, you guys okay. Are I, I, I see you what you're guys doing are, there. You guys are killing me. <laughs> There's I see what's going on. on. There's literally someone on Letterbox. I don't know if you guys saw this, that like, and maybe it's one of you as a plant who wrote like, <laughs> there's this amazing monologue that the father tells about a snake in the book. And I really wish they had done it in the movie. I bet Pat Healy would have done a really good job with it. What's and I'm like, mean? fucking, you did shoot it. And I did do a really good job with it. It's okay. When I saw the movie and it was gone, I was surprised. I was glad they didn't tell me ahead of time. Uh, because the movie worked without it. It, it, it wasn't necessary to be there, but it was well, something that I, it was a piece of work that I was particularly proud of. Well, yeah, clearly snakes have something, snakes have something to do. There's a, a, at least one snake who pops up in, in the film. Snake imagery is, is part of the market. I, I, it sounds to me like it would have gone in perfectly. I, I certainly would have liked to have seen it. Uh, you know, to, to needle you just a bit though, Max, uh, of the scenes that actually were in the film. Yeah. Which one so, was your favorite? To, to not to no longer be a dick. Um, no. My favorite is the good boy scene, definitely, because not only is it just ex executed so well, as Sean said, I was one. I was the one who got to click the uh, the audio track of Ozzy. So I was on the opposite side of the bathroom door when they were like pretending to be getting sucked on by some demon dog that sounds terrible but you know what i mean so i was the one who had the phone hooked up to the speaker i got to hit the button and it was awesome it was a great experience Fantastic. i just want to finish by going back and not leaving this alone and beating a dead horse by saying that if i'm not nominated for an oscar this year it's sean's fault because he cut that out of the movie and cost oh, me my absolutely. oscar okay that's it We'll make, sure, it, we'll make sure that the Academy all gets the, the deleted scenes. There you go. There you go. <laughs> we also recorded a commentary track for that Blu-ray and DVD. Do you know if IFC approved it? There will be a commentary track. Okay. We, nice. we said some things on it. I don't know. They edit those. I've done some of those before. They'll edit things they don't like out of it. Well, that's disappointing. Not, well, not at, IFC in particular, but just anybody. Like, There's always a standards and practices legal department that the certain things you can't say i'm not going to be in it at all then <laughs> yeah. wow. gonna cut everything twice. i set out sounds I've like I've, I've been there sounds like there's some uh uh stories to be told some uh, opinions to be shared here or elsewhere uh, as max sees fit uh next question though is for uh sean uh, are you personally a fan of horror uh, what were some of the first horror films that had an impact on you? Yeah, I mean, some of my first memories of watching films or horror, gathering together with my friends and watching movies we absolutely shouldn't have been watching when we were much too young. Um, I remember very strange movies to be absolutely terrified by, but I remember feeling physically ill while watching Jason Goes to Hell. Um, as I was probably in like fourth grade, um, maybe third grade, third or fourth grade. I don't know. I'd have to look it up the chat. Um, but yeah, I think that it's funny because when I first wanted to be, become a filmmaker, horror films were the things that really drew me to want to be a filmmaker. Um, and then I got away from it in, you know, in my 
career in making films and hadn't made anything even remotely horror related. And so I think it's, I think the things that influence you when you're young are often your deepest influences. So the fact that I came back and did my first narrative feature as a horror film, I think is very fitting. And I think has sort of, uh, as I was preparing for this film, reignited a love uh, of horror for me that hadn't been there in a while and hasn't gone away since. So this this will not be the last one. Oh, fantastic. That's great to hear because uh, you made a lot of fans already with this one and can have a lot more fans. Uh, Pat, got another question for you. Uh, you're also on Amazon's new horror series, Them. Uh, very scary, really, really cool stuff. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what working on that show was like? Uh, what was the best part about working on that series? It was a really difficult show to do. Uh, it was um, not fun for me. Uh, it was uh, a very, uh, the subject matter was difficult. The, uh, you know, it was a very expensive show. There was a lot, a lot going on in it. Uh, I did not have a good time making it. Um, uh, and I have gotten a lot of hate mail uh, as a result of it, the oh, character wow. that I play. So oh, I actually really shame. don't like talking about it, to be honest yeah. with you. Uh, uh, which is not to say anything about the show itself, but it just, uh, my experience with it has been almost entirely negative, um, which is unfortunate because like, I like to commit to um, things that I do uh, wholeheartedly, no matter what they are. And I guess um, some people don't know the difference between TV and real life. Sure. And there's, there's a lot more of them than I would like to believe there are, but unfortunately there's a lot of them. And it really yeah. uh, began to uh, upset me and affect me in, in uh, ways that I, I, I didn't like. So yeah, I don't, I don't like talking much about that show, but uh, well, sure. not, not, to, not to disparage it in any way, just... I feel uh, like anything I say I say about it is is uh, um, d digging some sort of grave for myself. No, no. Well, listen, uh, you, you gave us a really uh, uncandid moment here, and, and I appreciate that. You know, I, I'm sorry if I brought up the you know something that, that uh, weighed on you in any way, but you know, I, I do appreciate your candor, and I think people will understand. You know, it, it has to hurt uh, giving your all to something and having people see a, a character or or a moment in time and trying to apply that to who you are off screen. Uh, I, I'm not an actor. I can't imagine uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, weird pressure that must put on you, but you know, uh, I, I respect your answer and, and I appreciate your answer, sir. Uh, thank you for, for going there at least. Sure, thank you. Uh, well, let, let's switch right back into what we came here to do anyway, which is, is celebrating this film. I mean, can, can you just talk about, uh, can, Pat, can, can you just tell us one of your favorite behind the scenes moments, uh, maybe some great memory you have of working with this fantastic cast? Well, it was just, it was, first of all, really, I mean, I was living alone during the pandemic. And as I said, I was recovering from an accident. So like, I hadn't really been around anybody for, you know, six months. Uh, it was just nice to be part of a community again. We all lived in the same hotel. The hotel was in the same parking lot as the stage. So we'd walk from the hotel to the stage and we'd be in there and um, we would laugh a lot. And we made, you know, I think lifelong friends with each other. It was super intimate. Um, I had a lot of fun um, just letting loose. I mean, as you sort of said, like the script goes to like, you know, very strange and unusual places. And that really freed me to, you know, just try whatever, which was encouraged for better or worse by, by Sean. And, and uh, I, I felt very um, supported by everybody, you know, being able to do that. It's very, it's a very cathartic uh, kind of work. Um, which is I, which is about all you can ask for when you do something like this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, seriously, it's, no one likes to hear about people who going through rough times. But again, it, it seems like this film is just a, another really wonderful example of, of making something positive out of something negative. You know, a pandemic, a, a low point in your life. But if you could put that energy uh, focus you know, work, work within uh, those parameters, uh, you can really make something great. Because that, that's one of the crazy things about 
we need to do something is that it's a, it's a movie about parameters, you know, uh, but it doesn't feel like a movie that was constrained. I, I don't look at this film and think, oh, they did it this way because it was COVID times and they had to have a small cast and a single set. I look at that story as being exactly how it needs to be and portrayed exactly as it should be. It, it, it's not a film that looks like it wants for anything. So, uh, you know, and, and clearly, you know, when a film affects me like this, it, I can tell it's because there was a, a real camaraderie amongst everyone at, at, at every stage of development. And, you know, talking to you guys here just proves all that, uh, which is why I'm just so excited to be here with you guys and, and talking about these, this film, because it's great. All right, we're, we're about to just kind of like get deep into the nitty gritty like I've been wanting to do. But uh, let, let's kind of preface it with just kind of like an open conversation that I'd love for everyone to weigh in on. And Amy, maybe we'll even start with you. Uh, th this is kind of a film where for a lot of it, people are asking like, what's going on and is it real? Uh, do you think it's okay to have a film where you never really know what's happening? Yeah, I mean, I think that's... Uh you know, one of the really interesting parts about this film. I mean, I certainly jumped to my own conclusions about, you know, I, I saw this film and I thought, this is amazing. They're killing off all the men. This is gonna be really <laughs> great. It's just gonna be women left over. Um, and, you know, I went with that fully with the, with the production design, you know, with the color choices um, and, you know, the power that eventually takes over, so. That was my take. Amy said wow. that you both very seriously and very casually in a way that was like borderline threatening when she agreed to sign on to the film. She said, I have uh, to sign on to this because all the men end up dead. Nice. See, I didn't even, uh, that's that's a perspective that doesn't uh, jive with my uh, own theories about the film, but that's definitely an aspect of it that I hadn't fully considered. Uh, another thing that's going to make me uh, excited to rewatch the film. Well, what about the rest of you guys? Like, do you think that, that uh, film fans like have a legitimate gripe when they say, oh, the film didn't tell you what happened and how are we supposed to know how to feel if we don't know exactly what went down? I mean, I think anybody, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, uh, but uh, I kind of get irked by that whole thing. It's like, you know, I hear a lot about the ending and there's other films I've been in where people complain about the ending, you know, and it's like, well, you know, when the projector goes off, like we're not still running around up there. You know what I mean? Like you saw everything that hap is that we wanted you to see. So we want you to, you know, you can make up your own mind. I personally can't imagine, and I'm sure Sean and, and Max can't imagine anything that, I mean, you do, if you do show something, it's disappointing to people because it can never match up to what that imagination could be. But whether or not you like that, I think what I just said is perfectly acceptable, but some people just don't like that. And that's, that's yeah. their, you know, that, that, that's everybody's different. So people, everybody's wired different. Everybody thinks differently. So I think it's sure always a legitimate gripe, you know, if, if it's not something that you like, but I don't, I don't think it's inherently, you know, a bad thing in and of itself. Right. You know, yeah, Max and Sean, uh, you know, uh, there are clearly uh, clues and breadcrumbs here. You know, uh, is is this a puzzle that you uh, are, are hoping people can crack or is it the kind of thing where we do have to kind of be content to just not know for sure? So with the writing of the book and the screenplay, to me, it was never unanswered of what is going on. I I have explanations throughout the, the movie and the book. I don't, I don't spell anything out. I, I offer possible suggestions. Some of those suggestions are leading you down the wrong way. But I do think that if, if you pay enough attention to it, maybe if you watch it a second time, it's pretty easy to understand what's going on. But also, for me at least, writing it, what interested me was what was going on in the bathroom. I was never too focused on what was going on outside the bathroom. And it, like, as Pat was saying, I've like, I've seen reviews too of just people really, really upset that we don't show them what's going on outside the bathroom. But that's just not the type of movie or book I wanted to make. I wanted right. to make, 
I wanted to make something about a family in a bathroom, not stuff going on outside of a bathroom. Yeah, yeah. It's the difference between what's ha- what it's the difference between uh oh man, I feel like I had this perfectly. It, it's the difference between what it's about versus what's happening. It's about a family. What's happening is uh, maybe open for debate, maybe not. Uh, Sean. Yeah, I think that I committed pretty early on after a conversation with Max to never answering or or really leading the audience down a path towards what was happening outside the bathroom. We, We just committed to that we're not even going to know exactly what's happening outside the bathroom because what's happening inside is the horror show, right? It's the way that this family dynamic explodes when this horrible thing happens outside. Um, I also think that just in general, all of my favorite art allows the, the viewer or consumer to come up with their own ideas, their own interpretations, and really has that respect for the audience that um, we, we are going to let you keep those opinions, those ideas, those philosophies, whatever it is that you come up with the theories for what's happening. Um, Because I think that that allows for conversation, it allows for thought, and it allows for you to make, allow that piece of art to become your own in some way. And that's, that's just vastly more interesting to me. I love that, Sean, (laughs) because you're really giving ownership of, of the film to the viewer uh, in a way that uh, I think a lot of filmmakers would resist. So uh, congratulations to you on, on having that really progressive artistic mindset because I, I think that's exactly true and, and I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. Pat? I just, I also happen to think that the movie is a complete experience. It's a complete movie that has a beginning and middle and end. It, it isn't, I don't, I don't want anybody to think there's some obtuse piece of you know, abstract art, it isn't at all. So it, it, it just happens to have some ambiguity in it, but it, it is a very satisfying experience. It's about something, you know, a family trapped in a bathroom during the storm. But like, as Mike Nichols said, you know, a movie is about something. And then it's also about something else, you know? So it's about all these things, you know, where we are as people, you know, where, where families are, where American families are, you know, uh, relationships, you know, and the, the self, destructive qualities of people and in relationships and all kinds of other things and so uh yeah you're not going to watch it and just be like oh i you know i don't understand this at all i mean you know you you shouldn't try so hard to try and you know just let the movie sort of happen for you and and it is a complete story there's no yeah, it's absolutely. Like it's, the story itself is, is a, I think, a pretty clear reaction. Super structure. simple, yeah. Yeah, it's extremely simple. Like, what, what's actually the, the actions that take place and what's in the script and what happens is extremely simple. And I think that's actually part of what's cathartic about this, especially in the time that we're living, is when we made this in October of 2020, we were all like, when is this thing going to end? And the sure. there was like, there were those magical like couple of weeks in June, 2021, we were all thought it's over. Now we're back in this place where we all kind of feel like, when is this going to end? And I think that hopefully viewers can get some catharsis from the movie that, that I think we actually all got from making it, which is, we don't know when this nightmare ends in our real lives, but this movie ends very definitively and you move on. They're, they're there horrors you are horrors your life continues well listen we also- even even all of this said it's like i don't believe that I, I mean like i said i feel like i ha- i have my own theories about what's going on and and like max kind of bolstered that when he said yeah the, you know what's happening you know what's going on so it's like all right we got like five minutes left let's just go full-on spoilers if you haven't seen the film yet plug your ears and maybe come back later uh, and I just kind of like want to ask and put it out there. Is this a film about two girls who uh, fooled around with witchcraft and destroyed the world? Potentially. Exactly. Not to me, it isn't. I mean, uh, you know, I have my own, I had to have my own reasons for, like I'm sure these guys do. And Max said he did. Like I had to have my reason for what I thought was happening that I'm not going to share um, because I needed to, we all need to make sense of our brains will do all kinds of things and try and find patterns and what's going on, no matter how random or chaotic they might be. So like playing that character, I came up with my own reasons of what I thought, you know, was, was happening, but 
you know, I just that, have to that. say, <laughs> Max and I have something that we've been working on that will completely fuck up everybody's idea of what they think is happening. Nice. Oh, yeah. What is that something, Sean? <laughs> I'm not going to say any more. Oh, you guys, you guys. I mean, Max, this is this is your baby, ultimately. I mean, how many layers are you willing to peel back? Um, I'm not allowed <laughs> to say anything, especially. <laughs> but I will say, I mean, opinions. going back to like, I mean, we need to do something as silly as old as time. I mean, family stuck in bathroom. Family eats demon dog tongue. We've all been. Of there. course. Yeah, of course. Can't deny it. Also, it's like I saw that movie, The Lighthouse, and I, I couldn't tell you what that was about, but I liked it. Sure. I had no idea what was going on in that movie, but I really liked it. So why does it matter? I don't care. Yeah. I don't really what? care. So if we is it film, good or isn't it? You know? if, we have, if we have filmed this in black and white, no one would say anything. <laughs> they would just there go, yeah, go. this makes sense. Totally. Yeah. I get it now. I get it now. Uh, well, listen, we've only got a few minutes left. I, I could talk to you, I could talk to you guys all night. It, it, there's so much to unpack about this film. You guys are all really fun to talk to, but uh, you know, we're, we're nearing the end of our hour. I do want to go around though and hear what everyone's working on now or next. Uh, starting with you, Amy, what are you working on these days? Um, I'm working on an Apple series that's uh under lock and key and I can't say a thing, but I'm really excited about it. Um, and other than that, uh, Master of None season three came out recently. Um, mm -hmm. It's what I was kind of working on concurrently with, with this one, so. Oh, fantastic, yeah. fantastic. And uh, any final thoughts about we need to do something and why folks who haven't seen it yet should be excited to check it out? It's really funny. <laughs> It's like, it's really twisted and funny. And that's that's what I love about him, yeah. There is so much really just pitch black humor in this film, you ain't lying. Uh, uh, Pat, uh, you know, uh, besides uh, uh, your current project, are you already looking to the future? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I'm finishing up here on Killers of the Flower Moon. And then uh, I have a, a top secret project to go to after this. Oh, uh, those are the most exciting <laughs> ones. <laughs> But everyone will know, uh, I suppose, I don't know, next year, whenever, whenever it comes out, that they will, they will know what I'm talking about. And uh, I just, I just uh, recur on a show on ABC called Station 19, which I haven't done any yet this season, but I, I'm going to do some later on. That, that'll be, I think it premieres, the new season will be on soon, uh, within the next few weeks, and expect to see me there sometime in the next I don't know, six months or eight months or whatever it is, however long these TV seasons go now. Oh yeah, um, we'll see you anywhere. We're, we're just such huge fans and uh, you did such an amazing job and uh, we need to do something. I can't wait for people to uh, to check it out, to see. Yeah, to see. yeah. thank you. And I also want to uh, echo what Amy said. The movie's really funny. I think maybe a lot of people are seeing it at home and they don't realize that because like every time I've been in an audience watching it, everybody's laughing. I think if you know it's okay to laugh, then you can laugh. And sometimes people are sitting at home thinking like, oh, is this serious? Oh, this is just stupid. And it's like, no, it's, it's funny. It's fun. Like, you just enjoy yourself. It's an yourself. absolute roller coaster. It's an absolute yeah. roller coaster. Just to, yeah, like, turn it on and enjoy. After, after yeah, the loose, last loose year and a half that we've know. had. <laughs> yeah, after the last year and a half we've had, like, that's when we, when we were making this movie, people were, the, I think we were talking to the cast and crew and saying, what's the tone of the film? The tone of the film was the tone of the year 2020, which is that there are dramatic moments, there are terrifying moments, and there's a lot of moments that you just have to laugh at or else you'd never get out of bed. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sean, what are you working on next? Um, I've had a couple of movies as a producer that we've actually wrapped production on, including one last week. Um, so those will you know, come out sometime in the next year. Uh, and then putting the pieces together to uh, get the next movie in the can that I'll direct. Another horror movie? Uh, very likely. Awesome. Well, you, you got a lot of fans at Dread Central, so be sure to keep us in the loop on everything because uh, we want to know about it. And I'm sure that our, our community does too. Thank you so much for being here. Congratulations Thank on your you. film. Uh, Max, uh, last but not least, I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, it just has to be really uh, 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 just emotional for you uh, considering, you know, you are, are the, the spark you are the wellspring. You, you created this uh, well-received novella, and now you're seeing it uh, actualize as this great film. 
are, are you still fully in uh, we need to do something mode or have you already started on your next project? Um, movie wise, I, I'm not looking at anything really at the moment. I'm, I'm mainly a book guy who is slowly getting into movie stuff. So I'm, I'm in the process of writing, uh, finishing a new book called Maggots Screaming, which is basically like a, a long Cronenberg type of book. Well, nothing happens, which sounds exciting only to me. Um, but I also run a publishing company called Perpetual Motion Machine, and we do a lot of spooky indie books. So check that out. I also nice. run a I also run a podcast called Ghoulish. And right now I'm talking to most of the crew and some of the cast from We Need to Do Something and doing like deep, long breakdowns of what, what's going on behind the scenes. I already released an episode with Sean and also an episode with Pat recently. And I have many more coming out into the future. So check that out. Yeah, if you're into podcasts, definitely check them out there. Uh, well, Max, uh, any final words about we need to do something and why people who haven't seen it should be excited to go check it out right now? They should be excited to check it out because I think it contains one of the most unique cameos. I'm not talking about Ozzy. I actually have a cameo in the movie that no one is talking about. So for like half of a second in the movie, if you if you pay attention, the toilet is actually me completely naked, painted like the toilet, like sitting in toilet mode, but only for a second. And then when you cut back to it, it's back to a toilet. And that took a long time with the makeup development to get me to look the same. And I just, I hope someone- It's not a full I, second, it's only 12 frames. Okay, yeah, you, you know you know camera talk. I, don't, I just know toilet talk, so. Well, you, um, you, you didn't have to sit on it. It was, it was not pleasant sitting on that, but you know. You were in that I think it worked. Work. Yeah, I was sitting on <laughs> Max. You guys, you and guys. He, he, wanted, he wanted authenticity, so I gave it to him. Oh, oh man. Cool. It, 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 you guys are such a fun bunch. It, it shouldn't surprise me that, you know, a bunch of twisted minds like you guys came together and made this brilliant piece of film. I want to thank you all for, for giving us your time this evening. If you're just tuning in, we've been talking about We Need to Do Something out now from IFC Midnight. It's a great film. And we've been here with Max Booth the Third, Sean King O'Grady, Pat Healy, and Amy Williams. This has been Dissecting Horror, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Until next time. See y'all later. Bye.